um, yeah, provided, yeah. um, provided that fits with you and, and your yeah, yeah, circadian yeah, rhythm. <laughs> no, no, that's completely okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Excellent. Um, what was this? There was a recent, I, there was a, there was a, a case report that was, um, published, I think yesterday, mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, it was, um, in the annals of neurology, I guess, um, insular stimulation produces mental clarity and bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> It was uh, for the first time an ecstatic aura has been evoked through the electrical stimulation of the dorsal anterior insula during pre-surgical invasive intracerebral monitoring in okay. a patient who did not suffer from an ecstatic form of epilepsy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I thought that was interesting. Um, there's obviously a lot of insula centric interest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I said, if only this happened every time I read a paper on the role of the insula in interoception or the somatosensory cortex, amygdala, thalamus, VMPFC, caudate, PCC, precuneus, hypothalamus, NTS, et cetera. Okay, so people are starting to come in. about 25 people with this. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so one thing if if people could um, mute their microphones um, during the during the talk um, for the Q and A period, that would help um, in case there's some potential feedback. Uh, okay. So maybe we'll wait wait another uh, one minute, and then I'll I'll get started with the introduction. I think we've got um, getting a pretty good group of people. Okay, I think I'll just get started. Um, so it's it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, everyone for a, a virtual um, WKW lecture to end the 2021 calendar year. We're in for a real treat. We have uh, Dr. Catherine Talon Baudry, uh, who's going to be uh, giving a talk titled uh, "From Visceral Signals to Subjectivity." Uh, I'll try to give a brief uh, intro, but it may be a little bit difficult. <laughs> So I'll try to go quickly. Um, Catherine Talon Baudry is a CNR, CNRS senior researcher in the cognitive in cognitive neuroscience at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. She earned her PhD in neuroscience in Lyon in 1997. Uh, after a postdoctoral fellowship and tenured position in Lyon in 2002, she moved to the Petit Salpetrier Hospital in Paris. I hope I'm pronouncing that semi correctly uh, um, to form her own research group. Uh, in 2012, she moved her group to the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, where she currently is, in the Department of Cognitive Sciences as part of a programmatic shift in her research that has led to some of the work you'll hear about today. Dr. Talan Baudry started her career as a vision scientist, aiming to understand the neural mechanisms behind uh, humans' amazing ability at deriving meaning from visual information. Uh, she's an electrophysiologist at heart, however, uh, fascinated by the rich complexity of brain dynamics. She did some early grid uh, electrocardiographic recordings in monkeys, but mostly worked in humans using magnetoencephalography uh, and electroencephalography in healthy participants and intracranial EEG in epilepsy patients, pioneering the field of gamma, uh, of induced gamma band oscillations in humans. Um, just one example of this is her uh, landmark uh, 1996 Journal of Neuroscience paper on stimulus specificity of phase-locked visual responses has been cited over 1,500 times. Um, the, I find that the, the methodological precision and clarity of her work is impeccable. 
uh, and a clear indication of how deeply and carefully she thinks about the issues related to each topic of study. She's received numerous awards. Uh, she was the president uh, of the Association of the Scientific, Scientific Study of Consciousness in 2017. She received an ERC advanced grant in 2014, as well as uh, numerous other research awards. Um, her current work is influenced by the hypothesis that the subjectivity inherent to consciousness relies on an egocentric reference frame generated in the central nervous system by the neural monitoring of visceral inputs. Uh, her background in visual processing has informed her work in this space and is directly relevant for the work you'll hear about today. Um, one of the things that I really appreciated uh, in, um, in learning more uh, about um, uh, Dr. Talan Badri Catherine on a, a more um, personal level, uh, there's a great current biology um, paper uh, Q&A, which, which I just found uh, lovely, um, a great way to get to know somebody um, uh, in, um, you know, from afar. Um, she was asked a question, uh, if not academia, what career might you have pursued? And, and you said, in a different life, I would have loved to be a photographer or a hat maker, but I'm not sure I have the necessary skills. Um, I'm very pleased that you decided not to, to follow those alternative career paths. Um, and uh, I found it really uh, uh, intriguing uh, that when you talked about your um, goals for respective scientific contributions in that piece, you said, I, I would like to contribute to bringing together the physiology of the whole organism and cognitive neuroscience to get a glimpse of an integrated living and thinking human organism, not just a free floating brain disconnected from its biological surroundings. Uh, so I, I think that um, that um, uh, impetus permeates your work um, and, uh, and, and each of the interoception related uh, studies happening at LIBOR are also uh, kind of relevant to that. Um, on a personal note, I'd just like to mention uh, that um, Catherine's uh, pioneering work on the relationship between the gut and the brain and the identification of a gastric network directly intersects with some of the work that we're doing uh, here at LIBOR. Um, and has helped to explain some of the surprising patterns um, of posterior midline EEG signals that we've seen in, our, in, our, in the brains of our participants um, of, with our vibrating capsule experiment. And this is not the first convergence of, of findings. Um, uh, uh, another independent convergence um, intersects with uh, other work that's happening in the lab. And so I'm very, very pleased uh, to be able to uh, welcome uh, Catherine uh, Talon Badri to give a WKW lecture. Thanks a lot, Saheb, for this really nice introduction. Uh, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, it's actually a bit, um, I, I feel a bit intimidated, intimidated because um, I'm rather a newcomer uh, in this field, while um, uh, uh, Liber has been pioneering a lot uh, of what I'm actually using in my, in my research. So let me share my slides. So I'll move to full screen, which means that I won't be able to see the chat. So if ever there is a need for some clarification question or whatever, uh, someone will have to be brave and interrupt me because I'm, I'm losing contact with you at that, at that point. Will do. Thanks. Okay. So, um, I've added a question mark to my title because of course, a number of the things I'm going to say are a bit tentative, but um, I first would like to step back a little bit and um, to tell you where I'm coming from, which is where most cognitive neuroscientists uh, are at the moment, I would say, which is to um, study the brain in relationship with its environment um, with this notion that the brain is sampling information from the external world, um, is you know, elaborating on this information and then acting. And um, this perception action, uh, perception cognition action loop um, is like the golden standard of cognitive neuroscience. Um, but I think it's missing part of the story. And I'm sure here uh, most people um, in this institute are already convinced and actually pioneered this field, uh, which is the fact that the brain is not um, isolated and it's actually coupled to a number of uh, physiological systems and organs. And here I will more specifically talk about the heart and the stomach. And um, this extension 
um, of the system which is interacting with the, the external world can be viewed roughly from two different angles. So one is simply an angle from brain dynamics. Um, the heart is beating, it's generating its own electrical rhythm. There is um, um, a related uh, phenomenon in, in the stomach uh, where a slow electrical rhythm is being generated as well. And from a purely physics perspective, you can consider that, okay, we have two electrical pacemakers which are coupled to a complex system. So those interactions are probably, you know, contribute to the dynamics of the brain, which would just be a purely mechanical aspect. And then, of course, there is something which is more related to the cognitive relevance, um, which is that actually the classical way cognitive neuroscience is considering interactions uh, with the external world. Um, actually, one of the uh, drive for this is that is the organism, which is um, around the brain, and this organism it needs to be fed, uh, it needs to be protected, and it needs to be regulated. So, actually, at the root of all the very elaborate models of uh, cognition we have at the moment is this basic uh, biological need. So I will, um, and so essentially what I will show in my talk is that first that the human neocortex speaks with uh, stomach and heart. And I think this is also important, uh, maybe not here for this audience, but for most cognitive neuroscientists, there is this idea that there is a cognitive brain, which does the clever stuff. And then there is some housekeeping, uh, which is probably mostly subcortical and looked at with some, you know, the, the, the idea that this is not very interesting. And what I just want to show is that this, those functions, uh, which are related to what's going on within the organism are really spread um, across regions that we, would, we might not have suspected to be involved um, in such functions. And then I move um, quite quickly to more cognitive aspects um, to show that the um, perceptual experiences, uh, spontaneous thoughts, emotions, and decisions are related to the dialogue between brain and viscera. So I'll first start with uh, some aspects of brain dynamics, and which was really, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a line of research that was started purely out of curiosity, <laughs> essentially. Um, so we record activity from the stomach. Um, so of course here you have some group who know more than I do about the stomach, so I feel a bit uncomfortable here. But um, just to remind everyone so that we are on the same page. So um, the, the, in the stomach, there is a very specific type of cells, the interstitial cells of Cajal, which are found in between the muscular layer, layers of the stomach. And those cells, even if they are not neurons, they generate their own electrical rhythm. And they are real pacemakers, so that if they are cultivated in a petri dish, they still generate this electrical rhythm. Um, and those cells, they produce the rhythm at all times, but during digestion, there is a reflex and the rhythm is then transmitted to the muscular layers. And this is what coordinates the contractions of the stomach during digestion. But those cells, they don't only make contact with the muscular layers, they also make contact to vagal sensory neurons. So it might be that this rhythm is actually transmitted up to the central nervous system uh, at all times, since the rhythm is generated at all times. So that's why, uh, sorry. And then we can uh, record the electrogastrogram fairly easily, non-invasively in humans by placing electrodes on the uh, abdomen of participants. And here is just one example of a raw trace um, of a participant with a median uh, amplitude of the electrogastrogram. So it's not our best recording, but it's not our worst recording either. And here you can see with the naked eye that there is a slow rhythm, which is the gastric rhythm with um, uh, a period of about 20 seconds. So it's really slow and it has a very nice uh, spectral signature. And on top of it, you can see the faster respiratory rhythm with a period of about four or five seconds. And 
uh, all those vertical lines here are the heartbeats with the heartbeats about, you know, usually a bit shorter than one second. So the question we asked was simply, uh, can we consider the stomach as an electrical pacemaker constraining spontaneous brain activity? So we had people in the, in the scanner, we recorded the electrogastrogram and the bold signal during rest. And we searched for voxels. So if we have the electrogastrogram here in blue, we searched for voxels whose time course was locked to the gastric rhythm. Okay, so it could be with a zero phase lag or with a longer phase lag, like this one in, in uh, light orange. Okay, as long as the lag was constant with the stomach, we considered that those voxels were phase synchronized or had delayed connectivity with the stomach. And when we do that, we find a quite extended network um, covering most of the uh, visual network here and of the somatomotor auditory network, which is within these green contours here. Okay, so really extended, actually. Um, so, sorry. so we find that all primary sensory areas and many um, secondary or higher order sensory areas are actually coupled with the stomach, but that most control regions, um, we have very little in the frontal lobe or in those parietal regions, um, so that the, the gastric rhythm appears more as a scaffolding mechanism um, that might bypass the uh, control region. So if I plot this on this old version uh, of the hierarchical organization of the human brain by Messalam, um, where you have the exteroceptive entry points of vision, audition, uh, somatosensory inputs, etc., with this idea that they are, they are analyzed and then they progressively converge into uh, multimodal areas and then they reach the um, grail of um, whichever higher order regions, which uh, sometimes, you know, depending on the current fashion, are the limbic system or the frontal lobe or the parietal regions. And what we find is that actually the gastric rhythm seems to be um, uh, synchronizing between regions um, and avoiding those regions where the integration of information is supposed to happen. So it seems like a new scaffolding mechanism, which is potentially interesting, um, but it's not like it explains the whole brain dynamics. Okay, Within the gastric network, uh, the phase of the stomach explains about 15% of the variance of the bold, which means that it's certainly not negligible. Um, but it's not the only source of variance, uh, which is certainly good news as well. And then this gastric network presents itself as an organized sequence. So this cartoon that I've made here on top um, tries to illustrate this so that we have some areas that are synchronized with a short delay and other areas which are synchronized with a long delay. And we find that, for instance, uh, somatosensory cortex is synchronized with a short delay, while visual regions are synchronized with a long delay. So we could find very similar things using MEG this time, which was important for us because the nature of the bold signal is not always very clear. So here we recorded more directly the um, electrical activity of the brain using MEG, and we searched for something which is called phase amplitude coupling, which is a kind of brain syntax, which has been seen in many different brain regions, between brain regions, uh, mostly in rats, but also in humans. So we search for a modulation of the amplitude of brain rhythm, depending on the phase of the gastric rhythm. So if, for instance, here during a trough, you would see a, an increase in the brain rhythm in gray. And during a peak of the gastric rhythm, you would see a reduction of a given brain rhythm. And we found that such phase amplitude coupling does actually occur in the alpha range. So around 10 Hertz, that's a dominant rhythm of the brain at rest. And this coupling occurred in uh, along the parieto occipital sulcus, which we found also coupled in the in the bold. And uh, this is a region which is known to uh, generate the alpha rhythm. And we also found some coupling 
in a more complex cluster that included subcortical regions, uh, some anterior insula, and uh, the inferior frontal gyrus. Interestingly here, we could assess the directionality, so we could measure whether it were the stomach influencing the brain or the other way around. And we, here we had like overwhelming evidence for an influence from stomach on brain rather than from brain on stomach. So that's, um, and then of course there is this intuition we have that um, there, is, there might be a link with anxiety. Um, so in, in English, you, you would say that someone has uh, butterflies in one's stomach. In French, we say that we have a knot in our stomach when we're anxious. But actually, we did not find anything interesting. Um, so we have large samples of young, healthy adults during resting state. So they are not uh, screened for anxiety or whatever. So they cover the normal range of anxiety. Uh, in a young LC adult population, but still we have Bayesian evidence for an absence of link with anxiety in terms of EGG parameters. So like the frequency of the gastric rhythm or the amplitude of the gastric rhythm or the regularity of the gastric rhythm, um, but also in the um, uh, strength of the coupling between uh, the brain and the EGG as measured with functional MRI. Okay, so again, it doesn't mean that if we induced some uh, anxiety state, there might be something, but at least during resting state, we don't find any link there. And we do have evidence for an absence of link. Okay, so um, at the moment, we don't really know what this gastric network is doing. We are working um, on it, but, but we don't have any clear evidence. Um, and I'll switch to things which I are more cognitively relevant, um, but I also switch to the heart uh, in this case. So the, um, and then I will dive into this question of subjectivity. So subjectivity is not a term which is very often used in cognitive neuroscience, also um, in, in clinical practice or um, in, in uh, more clinical research, it's, it's much more common. But in basic cognitive neuroscience, it's usually a term people try to avoid. Um, so I'll just give you my take on it, which is that it's actually um, something which is related to three different fields in cognitive neuroscience. One is consciousness research, where here we do talk about subjective experiences, and those are mostly um, perceptual experiences that have a certain quality. So for instance, if you see, um, if you eat this delicious dessert by um, a French chef, uh, it's called an ispaon and it's just wonderful. Um, or if you go base jumping, you will have very different subjective experiences and those ex experiences have different qualities. Um, but in the decision-making literature, this would be presented as, okay, there are two different items and those two different items are associated with the subjective reward value. And here subjective means only means that they are intersubject differences. And then in the domain of emotions, I would say that we might have something which is a bit mixed. You might have an emotional feeling, uh, but then there is also a link with the notion of, of reward um, and of value. And actually my take on subjectivity is something which is probably common to all this, but I'm coming from the field of consciousness research where we talk about subjective experiences that have a certain quality. But fundamentally, um, something which is often not considered is that it doesn't make sense to talk about subjective experiences if there's no subject of experience. And, um, it might sound completely trivial, say, yes, of course, if someone says, mm, this tastes delicious, uh, he's a person experiencing this. But it's not trivial if you think about brain processing, because we know that a lot of the processing that goes on in the brain is unconscious. It doesn't give rise to an experience. Okay? So how come that some of the brain processing comes with 
those subjective experiences that do have a certain quality. There is something to understand there, so it's not trivial. It's not sufficient that it's happening in my brain. There must be something on top of it so that I feel that as my experience. And that's where uh, bodily signals and in particular visceral signals are particularly interesting because um, the fact that the brain is constantly monitoring what's going on in the organism might be the base for a very simple form of self, which is derived from this notion of organism, which needs to be protected, fed and regulated. And the signals from the heart or from the GI tract are particularly interesting because they are life sustaining. They constantly feed the brain with inputs and they have many entry points in the central nervous system, meaning that those signals are available to many different areas. Uh, and this I showed for instance, in the gastric network, the fact that it's actually present in many different brain areas and not only the so-called primary interoceptive. Um, cortex. So what I have in mind is that um, is this idea that the fact that the brain is monitoring those internal signals um, gives rise to subjectivity, uh, or rather that it's a kind of tagging mechanism that allows for the existence of things as varied as a subjective perceptual experience and emotional feelings a conscious reflection on oneself or the fact that we can dissociate ourselves from others, but also for notions of preferences and rewards. And the aim, uh, my aim now will be to try to convince you that there is something in there, or at least that we do have some experimental evidence that backs this claim. But one point that I want to make pretty clear at that stage is that here, I'm not talking about changes in bodily states. Okay, here in this hypothesis, this is not required. As long as there is some signal, so as long as the heart is beating, as long as the interstitial cells of Kahal in the stomach are functioning, you don't have to have a change in the body. There is a signal, it's, it, the, the brain is monitoring something and the actual bodily state does not really matter. And whether it's changing or not does not matter. And I'm also not be talking about the conscious perception of visceral signals. In this hypothesis, it's not required. Here, the monitoring of visceral signals is something that might happen unconsciously, but then this mechanism might be used for, the, for other types of conscious perceptions of feelings. Okay, so now I'll just go to some experimental evidence and I will be talking a lot about the neural response to heartbeats. So some of you here are super familiar with it, but just in case, um, I just, you know, we'll start with what is very standard, a visual evoked response where you present a stimulus uh, to a participant, you record brain activity with EEG or MEG, get some noisy data. Then you repeat the presentation of the stimulus, you get more noisy data that I just superimpose here again and again. And then you average all those noisy data and you see a transient, which is considered to be the transient response of the brain to this transient input. And one can apply exactly the same logic, but this time the stimulus is internal and it's the heartbeat. So we can say that now the stimulus is, for instance, at the time of the R peak in the electrocardiogram, get noisy signal, get more and more heartbeats, more and more responses, and then you get a transient. Okay, so those are simulated data. But if one does that with uh, electrophysiological data, one can actually see the heartbeat evoked response. So this was discovered initially in the group of Chandri in the 80s. And this is an example in intracranial recordings in the group of Cairn over the um, somatosensory cortex, where you can clearly see a transient response. And this is in our own data in, in uh, primary somatosensory cortex, where uh, if the time zero is the RP, you can clearly see this uh, sharp and clean um, response to heartbeats which by the way shows that the somatosensory cortex is also viscerosensory, which is something which is mentioned in papers from the 1950s, but which seems to have been forgotten along the way. And so I will now present you a series of experiments 
Um, and I'll just mention here that I will always be talking about the heartbeat evoked response that we control that what we see is really locked to the heartbeat. It's not something else. And also we carefully monitor for changes in bodily state or in cortical excitability. And we never find differences, except if I mention it explicitly. Okay, so now we have this program to look at subjectivity from very different aspects. And maybe I will start with something which is kind of more um, explicit, which is um, self-relatedness and self-other distinction. So we did an experiment, which is a, an interrupted thought paradigm, um, where uh, we just asked participants to fixate uh, the screen for quite long intervals, uh, tens of seconds. And uh, of course, they started to mind wonder. And we interrupted them with this type of white dots from time to time, where we asked them to remember what they were thinking about uh, just before and to rate the self-relatedness of their thoughts. They were trained beforehand to do that. And we wanted to see whether the way the brain is, the, the brain is responding to heartbeats depended on what participants were thinking about. And we found that it was actually the case. So if we look at the um, heartbeat evoked response um, for thoughts where, uh, that were highly relevant to the self or not very relevant to the self, we do find differences in two brain regions, ventral medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate. So here, um, the self-relatedness of thoughts might seem something like a bit fuzzy. Um, it was actually quite specific. We asked participants to rate two different things. One thing was whether they were thinking about themselves. Uh, sorry, I get some message on screen, but then I need to, I can't, can someone respond to this or? Because I need to change my pointer to have access. Um, are you seeing a, a message on your screen? Yeah, I get a message on my screen to say that someone wants to, I don't know, okay. I, um, we, we can okay. see your pointer. Yeah, yeah, it's just that I, I need to exit and change my pointer, et cetera, if I want to. Okay, fine. I found a way and I just go back to it. Okay. So uh, what um, participants were asked more precisely to rate their thoughts, so whether they were thinking about themselves um, as, uh, and this, was apparent in VMPFC, so that where they were thinking about themselves, we had a larger response. They also rated another aspect, um, which is a bit more subtle, which is how much they were engaged as an agent in the thought. Like for instance, if you're thinking, oh, um, I need to go to the supermarket this evening, then you're probably more thinking about the supermarket and your grocery lists and what's in your fridge, uh, what's missing, etc. So you're not thinking about yourself, but you're engaged as an agent in this thought. Well, if you're thinking uh, it's raining, uh, you're not engaged as an agent in the thought. So this aspect um, was reflected in what was going on in the posterior cingulate cortex. Okay. And we were lucky um, to verify those results because here we are talking about you know, responses to heartbeats, which are a tricky measure measured non-invasively, et cetera, we could verify our findings with intracranial EEG in epileptic patients um, during um, uh, uh, pre-surgery exploration. And we had two patients, one with an electrode in the posterior cingulate cortex and another one with an electrode in VMPFC, and we could actually replicate the findings we had in healthy participants with MEG, and I'll just show you in VMPFC, so this time we can measure the heartbeat evoked response amplitude in a single thought, okay, and correlate this amplitude with the ratings of the patient uh, as to whether the patient was thinking about himself or not. And you can see that we get a pretty neat correlation. So I know it's just one patient, um, you know, uh, one electrode site, et cetera, but this is just a type of results where I'm kind of convinced that this is this heartbeat evoked response is meaningful. It has something to do with 
what this particular patient was thinking about or whether he was thinking about himself or not. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I get someone drawing. <laughs> That's kind of disturbing, but. Uh... So we did another experiment where we were more wondering whether the heartbeat evoked response would dissociate cases where people were imagining themselves in an unfamiliar scenario, or whether they would imagine someone else uh, in another scenario. And if we measured the heartbeat evoked response during the imagination period, we could find that indeed it dissociated whether participants imagined themselves or someone else. So there was some link with the self other distinction. So <clears throat> I now present you um, an experiment on subjective perception, uh, which is a very standard experiment in consciousness research uh, where we present a stimulus at threshold for conscious perception, which was this grading within an analyst. Um, so for the participant, participant fixated, and when fixation was good, the fixation dot became red. And then after variable delay, this analyst could appear. And here you can see it fairly well, but of course it was titrated for each participant so that uh, the, the contrast uh, was super low and participants could detect it in about half of the trials. And then after another variable delay, um, they were just asked whether they had seen something or not. And we were interested into what was going on actually before stimulus onset, because we tend to think about conscious vision as a result of visual processing, plus some things going on after. But actually the golden standard to study conscious vision is when the participant can say, yes, I've seen the stimulus or I see the stimulus, meaning that there is there are things related to the stimulus and so there are stimulus related processes. This is well known, but there might be also something about the mindness of the response, the eye who is seeing the stimulus that we think might be indexed by the responses to heartbeats. So that if you, have, if you are more or less ready to see something at the conscious human being, you might, uh, this might be indexed by uh, the response to heartbeat so that there are some moments where you are more ready to see an incoming stimulus, but you are also responding more to your heartbeats and moments where you are less present as a human being and your responses to heartbeats are smaller and you don't see the stimulus. So this is actually what we um, tested in this experiment. And we found that indeed, we do find the larger responses to heartbeats before the stimulus appears, okay, in hits, so when there is a stimulus and participants see it, but also in false alarms, so that when there is nothing on screen, but participants will say, oh yes, I've seen something. It's quite a large effect because the amplitude of the heartbeat evoked response explains about 10 points of variation in hit rate, which is actually quite large. And this happened again in ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and but also in the right inferior parietal lobule. And so we wanted to push things a little bit further to better understand um, what is the heartbeat evoked response doing. So we looked at whether it influenced sensory uh, criteria, uh, D prime. So uh, the 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 really the sensory part of the decision or more the decision criterion. And um, this is what you can find, what you can see here, which is as the amplitude of the heartbeat response is increasing, actually the sensitivity D prime is increasing while the criterion, the decision criterion is unchanged. Okay, so it really seems like the heartbeat evoked response behaves as sensory evidence in this decision to say, I've seen the stimulus. It's obviously not visual evidence, okay? But it contributes to saying, I've seen the stimulus. And we think that a likely interpretation of this finding is that to say, I've seen the stimulus, is actually a combination of heartbeat related information that pertains more to the eye, to the subject of experience, 
and to how visual information is being processed. And um, although there has been no independent um, replication of this finding, there are related findings in the somatosensory modality uh, by Ezra Al in the group of Arno Wilhenger, which were published in PNS uh, recently. So there is um, evidence that subjective perception is related to heartbeat evoked responses. And um, we do find also that preferences the expression of preferences, which is something which is very subjective, is also related to heartbeat evoked response. So this we assessed in um, an experimental design where people had to say whether they prefer Forrest Gump or Matrix. Okay, and it was written in with characters. This has to do with a control condition that I'm not going to present. And so here, our hypothesis was that the heartbeat evoked response before we presented the options could interact with the subjective value encoding. And in this experiment, this is what we found. So we recover uh, value encoding uh, during option presentation. And we find that it's as expected from the fMRI literature, it's engaging in particular the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. <coughs> Sorry. And um, we can then show that um, when subjective valuation integrates HERs so that we look at the interaction between uh, the heartbeat evoked response and the value signal, when the interaction is strong, the psychometric curve is steeper, showing that we have preferences that are more consistent over time. And finally, um, I want to uh, present an experiment we did on emotional feelings. So it might seem weird that I'm taking so much time to get into the emotion aspect because uh, traditionally visceral signals have been associated with emotions, with this idea that we feel what's going on in our body and that this contributes or is a determinant uh, of, what, uh, of our emotional feelings. But actually, in the, what I've presented so far, there was nothing emotional. I mean, perceiving a grading at threshold is certainly not emotional. So, and I have this idea that there might be some underlying component, which is actually common to all those things, including emotions. So the question was really, is there a contribution of heartbeat evoked responses to the subjectivity of emotional feelings, but independently from bodily changes, okay? In everything I've shown you so far, there were no change in bodily state, at least no change we could detect. And participants were not consciously perceiving their visceral signals. I mean, when we are trying to detect a faint grading on screen, you're not paying attention to your heartbeats at the same time. So um, we did that in a paradigm where we asked participants to rate valence and arousal to, in response to emotional scenes. But actually, um, they were instructed to do that either from their own perspective, so what do they feel, or from the perspective of the person presented in the picture. Okay, and so there were pictures where it was very similar, and for other pictures, we had a bit more of a dissociation. And so we analyzed the heartbeat evoked response during the instruction, so where participants are actually preparing to you know, adopt their own perspective or the perspective of someone else. And we did find that indeed the heartbeat evoked response um, does dissociate between self and other before presenting any emotional stimulus, okay? Which was kind of expected from previous, our previous results. We then had the moment where participants were, um, uh, you know, viewing the, the image and when they preparing to rate the emotion that either they felt directly or the emotion they recognized in uh, the uh, people in the scene. And we find the classical markers, physiological markers of emotions in the sense that we model the ratings. Uh, we model the physiological uh, signals 
uh, by the valence or arousal ratings. And we find, for instance, that the uh, zygomatic and corrugator both contribute to the valence rating with opposite directions, or that the skin conductance contributes to the arousal ratings, which are very standard findings. Um, but here, we were also interested to know whether this was dependent on the perspective participants adopted. And we found that it was indeed the case that, for instance, um, the, okay, my pointer is frozen, now it's back, sorry. So for instance, in the skin conductance, there is a pure effect of perspective. So whether you are rating an emotion from your own perspective or from the perspective of someone else um, is reflected in your skin conductance at a later latency than the classical arousal effects. Okay, so yes, physiological signals during the emotional stimulus are related to uh, the ratings that participants are giving, but perspective matters. But now the real crucial question was whether HERs um, contributed to the final ratings. Okay, so those heartbeat evoked responses that were given before any stimulus, emotional stimulus was appearing. So maybe I will start with the arousal ratings because they are a bit simpler. So here we put in a model, everything we found to vary with arousal um, uh, and the heartbeat evoked response. So for instance, we find that the zygomatic and the skin conductance contribute to arousal ratings. And we find actually Bayesian evidence for no effect of perspective, heartbeat evoked response, or any interaction between the perspective and physiological measure. But for valence, we find a more interesting picture. So uh, this is a bit of a complex model because many things varied with valence, but essentially what we show is that the zygomatic corrugator heart rate all contribute to the ratings of valence that participants are giving. But we also find that there is an interaction between the HER and the self other condition that you can better see here in those two plots. So here what it shows is that how participants rate the valence of the image from their own perspective is dependent on the heartbeat evoked response that occurred before stimulus onset. While if it's they are rating from someone else, they are rating the image from the other perspective, then there's no contribution of the HER. So it means that in the case of an emotional um, episode, the heartbeat evoked responses that are, occur here, they are not read as bodily arousal. I mean, they don't contribute to the arousal ratings at all, but they contribute um, into what I called independent valence evidence, okay? Because this is an independent contribution of the HER to the valence rating that is not explained by the physio measures during the emotional stimulus. And that is only in the self condition. So as if it were giving the specific color of the emotion that one experiences and not that one recognizes in someone else. Okay, so I think we can definitely say that yes, there is a contribution of heartbeat evoked responses to the subjectivity of emotional feelings independently from bodily changes. So it gives some weight to the idea that there is an underlying mechanism that might be common to many different aspects of perception, cognition, emotions that have something to do with subjectivity. I will just finally show in the last few minutes um, some data uh, from patients emerging from coma. So patients emerging from coma, but who are not, um, not communicating. And it's often very difficult to know whether they are conscious or not. And here we try to distinguish between participants which are in the so-called vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness state so that they have a sleep-wake cycle, but they don't show any sign of intentional behavior. And participants who are in the minimally conscious state um, uh, who show sometimes signs of intentional behavior. 
Actually, we uh, collaborated on this with our colleagues from Liège, uh, Yitka Hanan and Stephen Lores, where they also have the glucose meta metabolism of the brain, um, which gives another type of classification between those patients. But that doesn't matter. It can be one or the other for what I'm going to say. So what we simply did is that we had a number of patients where we knew uh, the clinical diagnosis. We trained a classifier to reproduce this diagnosis based on the heartbeat evoked response. Okay, so we had the, um, we knew when there was a heartbeat and then we took from 200 to 400 milliseconds after the, the heartbeat um, and we trained a classifier on this. Okay, then we have a new set of data where uh, our classifier makes predictions and then we can compare which was what the actual clinical um, diagnosis and we reach a certain accuracy, which is quite good, 87%, but that doesn't really matter. What was important is that then we tried to reproduce the same thing. So we trained classifiers on random EEG segments, same number of data, same length of segments, et cetera, except that this time it was not locked to the heartbeat. And so of course we can nevertheless reproduce, you know, to some extent, the clinical diagnosis, but systematically, all the classifiers we trained on those EEG segments had a lower accuracy than the classifier trained on the heartbeat evoked response. Which means that um, you might not be convinced by my idea that there is some mechanisms associated with subjectivity, but this experiment clearly shows that responses to heartbeats do convey some specific information on the consciousness state of those participants, of those patients. Sorry. Okay, so um, to wrap things up, um, I've shown you that by adding uh, visceral organs into the equation, we can not only account for some features of brain dynamics, but we do also find correlates of um, subjectivity that is trans-domain, which, um, you know, accounts for subjectivity in very different domains uh, that are classically studied either by consciousness research or by affective neuroscience or by um, decision-making um, or by uh, studies on the explicit self. Okay, and then I want to thank uh, people who did the real work, um, uh, who are the, the uh, doctoral uh, students and postdoctoral fellows in my group, uh, funding agencies, and also people who developed the toolboxes that are freely available to the community. Um, and thanks a lot uh, for your attention. Thank you, Catherine, for that uh, wonderful uh, talk and for navigating uh, some somewhat challenging uh, audiovisual uh, <laughs> difficulties there. Um, the annotation function was available for anyone to annotate. And if we were to remove it, then we would have to pause your lecture. So we didn't want to pause anything. Um, and thank you for, for um, leaving time for questions. Um, I'll open it up um, uh, to see if anybody has any questions. Can I uh, just, um, and this is really fascinating work. And it's, uh, um, it's really impressive how you have um, dissected the contribution of uh, the periphery to some very important central processes. One question I had and uh, that I wanted to see, um, you, you're showing that, for example, that the, the, the stomach um, uh, changes and then the heartbeat changes um, are represented um, in, either bold or MEG signal. Um, is there a possibility, and, um, and I'm sure you've been asked this before, that uh, what you're seeing is the relationship due to a third um, variable that influences both uh, in a sense, um, a meaning that, for example, uh, say with the, uh, with the um, stomach responses, uh, clearly, uh, you know, the, the direction goes both ways. Um, in terms of modulating um, uh, the the kahal the cells, um, so have, is there a way that you could potentially uh, disentangle uh, confounding that would create a relationship due to a third 
uh, um, a, a kind of a system, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, thanks. That, that's a very good question. And actually, um, the short answer is it's tricky, uh, but I can elaborate a bit. So in the fMRI study, um, we only see, I mean, it's really something which is, which would be formulated, I think, in the fMRI domain as delayed functional connectivity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it could go through anywhere and we have no idea what is the directionality of the interaction. So it could be, you know, it might be that there are, I don't know, we could imagine that there are some vascular changes at the same frequency than the stomach. Uh, that's tricky to eliminate. There are some indirect arguments, uh, um, indirect arguments against it, but it's, it's more difficult to prove. This said, we have a very robust um, electrical signal. So for sure, this signal is present. Whether it's relayed through vagal neurons, as I suggested in, in, my, uh, in the beginning of my presentation, we don't know. Um, given some of the regions we are finding and, uh, and what is known about, uh, I mean, the, the little that is known about anatomical pathways, it could also be spinal pathways. Um, and when discussing with a group of Peter Strick, uh, they would agree that probably spinal pathways are also involved. But as I said, we could imagine also all kinds of possibilities, uh, including some vascular effects. Um, and this would be tricky. So to the best of my knowledge, there is no report of a vascular effect at the frequency of the stomach. There are some vascular effects at different frequencies. But who knows? I mean, we know so little that I, I would not argue that we know for sure. What we did, so that's also why I, I always also present the electrophysiology data, because um, here um, we are closer to neural activity. Um, so a vascular effect is quite unlikely to give the results we have, except if this vascular effect were transduced into a modulation of brain rhythm. Which might exist, huh? but, but that begins to be a bit more far fetched. Um, and here we had some indirect measures of directionality. So, for the influence on the amplitude of the alpha rhythm, this really seems to be from stomach to brain. But again, those are measures of directionality which are based on you know, transfer entropy. So, it's not like it's a biological mechanism. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, when I speak with physicists about this, it's, it's telling me, okay, come on, you have. A complex system and you're plugging an oscillator to it this is typically the type of systems where mm -hmm. we can't even define causality so yeah there is a point where and and that's why I, i'd love to see what happens when when you stimulate the stomach or things like this because this way we would understand much better yeah mm. but that's something hopefully that uh, i will hear yeah. from, from but, but even then, when you stimulate, right, um, if, you, if you have sort of a, an acid-nutrient loop, right, you can put energy into the system, but can you really track it as it, as it moves about? Um, uh, so you might be able to amplify uh, an existing set of, of activities, but tracing the causality that we're, we're still finding is, is, is very challenging mm. to estimate. Yeah. Mm. Um, so we had a question, uh, a bit of a complex question uh, from uh, Alessandro in the chat. Um, I wanted to ask what happens, for example, if I take the same electrical signal that makes me see the green color um, when it hits the visual cortex and apply it to auditory cortex? Um, will, I, I, will I see the green color as I would if the electrical signal nervous impulse had gone to the visual cortex? Or instead, will I hear a sound? I ask because with this answer, we can find out if the subjective experiences are in the electrochemical impulses that move in the neurons, or instead, if they are in the neurons in the brain. OK, so that's a tricky question. Um, OK, so the way I see it, there are several questions in it. So maybe I will just reformulate. So one thing that I haven't said, which is actually very important. So. Uh, in my view, uh, consciousness is generated in the brain. It's not generated in the heart or the stomach, but it's a property of the whole organism. So I think that's an important distinction. 
Uh, I'm certainly not saying that the stomach is conscious. Okay, that's really not at all what, what I implied, but I think it's important to distinguish between the mechanism that we think are important to generate consciousness. And for me, those are in the brain because uh, consciousness is not generated in the heart or the stomach. But finally, the property of consciousness, I don't think that if you had a brain in a vat, we could say that it's conscious. I think it's really a property of an organism. Okay, and then we can think about all kinds of you know, thought experiment where, uh, yes, but if you remove this or if you remove that, et cetera, and my point is, that, okay, if you remove the heart, it's dead. So it's not conscious. But, but th that's just the kind of thought experiment that might not lead us anywhere. Then whether um, you can you know, plug a signal from one uh, sensory system to another, what would be the outcome? I, I, I think you would hear a sound um, just because that's how the brain is wired. So maybe I've missed something uh, in, the, in the question. I think there were multiple pieces to it. Um, one, one question that I would have um, is um, in terms of getting a little bit more at the causality, have you considered um, any uh, studies in lesion patients? So individuals sort of pre post surgical resections um, of, of putative uh, source regions like the VMPFC or PCC, which is kind of a, can be tricky or even just um, patients who have chronic um, neurologic, focal neurological injury to those regions? Mm. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. So first of all, I mean, um, I'm a scientist. I, don't, I have very limited medical knowledge, so I'm not sure I would be able to, to do much, uh, even if I were given you know, the best patients uh, um, one can imagine. But the other thing is that... Um, I did not insist too much on the localization of heartbeat evoked responses, but you might have noticed that they actually vary quite a lot from one experiment to the other. Certainly the MPFC is recurrent, but it's not always present. And it's not like it's the only source of interesting variations in the heartbeat evoked response. And so the underlying model I have in mind is that actually those signals, those visceral signals, because they are present in so many brain regions could actually be uh, a solution to the binding problem. But then if this is true, then it follows that it's not by lesioning one region that you can find an answer because it, what matters is that the representation is distributed. But then I have this problem that this looks like a super nice idea, but it's, you can't falsify it. So it's certainly not a scientific theory. It's at best an hypothesis. <sighs> yeah, so th that's where it's making me a bit uncomfortable. I, I, I want to push you this idea. I think there is something valid in it. But ultimately, I would need to be sure that there is a way to falsify it and that I don't fall into this loophole where you know someone has an idea, falls in love with it, and spend 20 years uh, proving the world that it's a lovely idea. Um, it has to be falsifiable, and, and that's a bit tricky. So I don't know. At the moment, we are more playing with trying to play with some uh, computational models, uh, because that might be a way to make also predictions. So might, maybe not in terms of lesions, because if it's distributed, that might not work, but maybe you know, of some co-occurrences or thing which would fit with predictions of the model. But I'm sure you will have great ideas on what one could do with patients or pharmacology or whatever, and it's just my, my ignorance which shows up here. I had, a, I had a question. I was just curious. Um... You know, so obviously, like, you know, in, in consciousness research generally, right, mm -hmm. there's all these different sorts of, like, leading but competing theories, like, like global neuronal workspace and, you know, higher order representation theories and things like that. And I guess I was just wondering how you would frame, you know, like, your results in terms of those different theories or if you'd find them supporting one versus another or how the kind of functional... Um, I mean, you answered this a little bit, I guess, when you were talking about um, it being a possible solution to like the binding problem, but where you see the kind of like functional role um, of, um, of this sort of influence, um, you know, coming up from visceral signals, um, you know, in terms of the sorts of like computational architectures and those theories that have been proposed. Okay, so there are three different points. So the first point is 
compared to okay, uh, what I would call hypothesis because they are not theories of consciousness because they are not falsifiable. So in that sense, they are hypothesis. Um, I think what I propose is just a bit orthogonal. What is clear is that, I mean, when I started to work on this, that was because I was not satisfied with the accounts of consciousness uh, because global workspace is just super cognitive so that it does not account for subjectivity. And I think this is what we need to explain. Um, um, IIT is in a way compatible because IIT is putting a lot of uh, emphasis on the properties of subjective experience. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, it's not really proposing a mechanism for relating the experience to the subject of experience. Mm -hmm. It's more like it would be an intrinsic property of the uh, integration and segregation of information processing. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit different. And then for a higher order theories, I mean, uh, they are interesting theories, but they are a bit far away from a neural uh, implementation at that stage. So it's difficult to compare. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the function of um, all this, um, I mean, I'm uh, convinced that subjective experience has a function. So in consciousness studies, it has long been said that, okay, we have subjective experience and that's uh, something we don't really understand and it has no function and it might be an epiphenomenon. And then uh, we have access consciousness, which is all the clever things we do, yeah. very roughly speaking. Um, I disagree with this and with my colleague, Axel Clemens, we actually uh, finishing the revision of a paper and making this claim that subjective experience has a function because all subjective experiences have intrinsic value. Uh, and then if they, have, if they are endowed with value, then they have a function because now you can compare things. Exactly the examples I gave, like all um, domains um, of uh, many different domains of, co of cognitive and affective neuroscience would say, if we talk about you know, the warmth of an embrace, for instance. So it's a subjective experience with a specific qualia in consciousness research, uh, it's an item that has its uh, own value in decision making. So you, you might want it or not. Um, and it has, um, of course, an emotional aspect. And I would say that all the, it's a different words, but ultimately it's the same thing. And that fundamentally it has a value. And because it has a value, then it's functional. So it's not like we have subjective experiences on top of something else. No, it's something specific. Uh, and, and this intrinsic value might bring a function to consciousness then. Mm. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah, I was just curious, like for instance, you know, with like the um, heartbeat evoked response, like I just wondered if, for instance, I mean, there's these ideas that you, you know, visceral signals and like predicted metabolic demands associated with those mm -hmm. signals will do some sort of like signal prioritization, you know, for example, right? So. So it's like saying, hey, what are the sorts of representations that are most relevant right now, um, you know, given expected bodily demands and things like that. And so, I don't know, I was just curious, like in relation yeah. to something like global workspace theory, where you're kind of prioritizing broadcasting of this signal over that signal based on say like visceral relevance or something like that. I don't know, I was just curious. Yeah, no, so I, indeed I have something quite different in mind because um, what is being broadcasted in the global workspace is what you're conscious of. And here I can guarantee you that in none of those experiments, participants were conscious of their uh, visceral inputs. I mean, they were concentrated on the task. And when you do that, you just don't perceive your heartbeats and you don't particularly, I mean, except oh. if you're hungry, you don't really perceive your stomach. Oh, no, I, what, I, what I had in mind was just that the, the unconscious signals from the body coming up are mm -hmm. prioritizing what sorts of extraceptive representations become conscious. Right, yeah, it might, this, this might be, this might be. And then my, the fact that, you know, when I say we have to solve the binding problem that's related to the question of the unity of consciousness. Uh, and this is something which is present in any hypothesis about consciousness and that the integration in IIT, that's the global workspace, um, in the global workspace, uh, this notion of unity. Um, so I think we all agree that we need to account for the unity of consciousness. Uh, it's just that the mechanisms to account for it are different in those different hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. All right, I, I think we're gonna have to um, to wrap up our, our talk because we're running a little bit over time, but um, 
please uh, join me in um, a warm round of applause uh, for uh, Catherine Talon Baudry. Thank you so much for a fascinating and stimulating talk. Thanks a lot. So we'll we'll uh, look forward to meeting with you again um, tomorrow. And and again, appreciate you giving us your evening. Uh, wish you a good evening, good night. <laughs> Thanks. And we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. bye.